Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Awesome. Hi, Mom. <laughs> we uh, just like to start our Sundays by welcoming anybody that's here in our sanctuary for the first time, or if you're joining us online for the first time, welcome to Hosanna. We're so excited to worship with you guys. I am Pastor Nathan, and this morning we are doing uh, part four of our four-part giving and generosity series, and this is going to be the conclusion of our series. I hope the last few weeks have been um, enlightening and a blessing to you guys and encouraging. I know for many of us, myself included, there's a little bit of like challenge and rebuke in some of it. And, uh, but we welcome um, the, the admonition of our Lord because He knows what's best for us and He will teach us and challenge us and even correct us when necessary. And so, but today we're going to be looking at the last part of this series, really dealing with some practical teachings regarding finances in Scripture. This is obviously coming after learning the biblical admonition to be generous people in line with the nature of our Lord and Savior, God himself who is generous, and looking at how giving as, as a member of the church, it's a part of our collective participation in the needs and the work of the ministry, the needs and the work of the body, and this includes the support of our local churches as we gather together to pool our time and our talent and our resources to reach out with the gospel. And then we learned how our modern call to financially participate in generosity, um, be it regularly, intentionally, generously, cheerfully, really is all based upon New Testament commands New Testament examples, and Old Testament principles. So after going through all that over the last few weeks, I want to end this series dealing with really just what Scripture has to say about good financial habits. Um, as I mentioned in the very first message of this series, you know, when we steward what God has given us poorly, when we practice bad financial habits, we can find ourselves um, really in a bad financial position. So many people are drowning in debt. They have leveraged themselves in debt to the point where they just can't do anything anymore because they're buried by debt. Um, oftentimes in that, in that debt relationship, people then find themselves buried by high interest rates and having to make minimum payments on things that just can uh, get out of control so quick. And really, a lot of people, even Christians within the church, find themselves in places where they feel like they're seemingly always broke. They're always out of money before the end of the month gets here, and they're barely getting by or living paycheck to paycheck and things of that nature. And really, we end up finding ourselves struggling, both for reasons that are out of our control, and there's some of that, but oftentimes for reasons that are within our control, and when we find ourselves struggling financially, and this is what I mentioned in the first message of this series, the first thing we sacrifice is our generosity. The first thing that we give up is our giving. Starbucks will win. Eating fast food all the time will win. <laughs> you know, living beyond our means will win in the priority list, but giving will be the first thing to go often. And so biblically, we know that that only exasperates the problem. When we stop being generous, when we stop being um, givers, biblically it makes it worse. Because as we've seen in our messages, the Bible is very clear about principles of we reap what we sow. If you give, you will get, right? And again, it's not about being greedy and materialistic people. It's about saying, God, I'm a steward of what you've given me. And God says, when you steward what I've given you my way, I will take care of you. I will take care of your needs. I will take care of your life. And so we reap what we sow, whether that's generosity or whether that's the lack thereof. And really the foundation of all of this is just that understanding that everything belongs to God. Everything, you know, not just the first part of our giving, not just your tithe if that's what you do, not just 10% or 20%. Everything belongs to God because he is the creator. He is the one that has given everything to us, and we as his children are called to then manage it well, and that's what stewardship is all about. And so God has much to say in his word about how to manage the finances and the stuff, even our time and even our talent that he has given us, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. 
really so that as we depart from this ser- uh, series and we're going to be going into the Easter season here just in a couple weeks to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, and then after that we'll be picking up at the very top of the Bible study in the book of Genesis. But as we exit this series, this topical series we've been dealing with, the idea is that we can move forward living as faithful, wise, diligent stewards of all he has given us ultimately able to follow then his example of outrageous generosity in our lives as we want to live according to his example and after his example. And through that, being people who experience the joy and blessings that come from financial obedience to the Lord with what he has given us, obedience both spiritually but also materially and financially. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, but we're going to start our day praising God. We just want to worship him. You know, he is the giver, as as we've been talking about for a few weeks now, and he has given us so much. But the most important thing he's given all of us is salvation. He saved our souls. He paid a price we can never pay. He died on the cross, a death that we should have died for our sin. And after that, man, everything is just bonus. But there is so much bonus for those who live obediently to the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for your word, God, and we're so grateful that your word teaches us um, everything, really, Lord. God, it's not just some lofty, intangible, spiritual thing, Lord. Um, It deals with so many practical things, Lord, that are a result of the spiritual truths we learn. And so, God, we're grateful that you talk to us about how to handle money. You talk to us about how to deal with the resources you've given us, Lord. And and God, truth be told, there are so many in the church today that are struggling because um, they may be living obediently in so many areas of their life, but when it comes to the finances you've given them, they're living in disobedience, Lord. And, and maybe, God, that through this series you've been teaching us, Lord, um, what your word says and how we should be, God. Lord, we don't want to be disobedient, disobedient people. And so maybe, Lord, some of us have learned Um, Our eyes have been opened to what your word says, and maybe some of us were just being outright rebellious, Lord, but God, we we thank you for your word that it teaches us, that it corrects us, Lord, that it shows us how to live, how to be righteous people, God, because that's what you're calling us to be, Lord. And Lord, ultimately, it's to live a life trusting you with everything, and that includes our money, Lord. We want to trust you with it, God. So teach us. Speak to us today, Lord. But first, we just want to praise your name, God. We're so thankful for every blessing, everything you give us, Lord. We're so thankful for everything you do in our lives, Lord, even the disciplines, God, because we know it's out of love. It's because you love us. So, Lord, be blessed today. Bless us today, Lord. We look forward to everything you're going to be doing, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Let's stand and rejoice in the Lord. To marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame Through the cross you are the truth You are the light, you are the way Because of the Lord, my 
Begin to worship the Lord this morning. The point and the whole objective is that we see Jesus. We see him in his, his glory, his majesty, the wonder of his love that we are experiencing right here and right now. Because it was that love that was born out on the cross. It is that love that caused him to shed his blood for us. Payment for our sin not paid by us, but paid by Him. Every stripe, every shame laid upon Him. How can we not say thank you, Lord? It is by His hand that we are here today, covered in the grace and blood of Jesus. He is wondrous, isn't He? And we give thanks to Him. You know, you may be seated as we continue worshiping, as we continue lifting up the name of Jesus, for He is the one who is our salvation. Jesus alone. And we give thanks. You know, in this time of coming into the house of God, as we've been so graciously and wonderfully taught through the Word this week, or these, this month, to know that we are emulating Christ in and through our giving. Our desire is to be like Him. You know, in the same way, we're called to, <clears throat> to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not about putting on more of the fruit of the Spirit, more love, more joy, more peace, more patience. It's about being like Christ, who is all those things. It's the same here. It's walking with Him. So I would encourage you that, you know, if you haven't done so already, this is the moment. 
This is the time to worship God in and through your generosity, your giving in the household of God. Right now you can do that online. You can use our app. You can use the website, whatever. In a couple weeks here, we'll be going back to having an opportunity to do that here in the, in the room as well. But I would encourage you to take it. You know, the whole point of doing it now as part of our worship service is because it is worship. It is for the King. So let's give thanks to the Lord as the body of Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are in this place. We thank you that you teach us, you speak to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you have called us as a church body to live a life for you, to reach out to a world that is lost and is dying, and to share with them the words of life that were given to us, that Jesus saves. Jesus forgives. Jesus holds us. Lord God, continue to use Hosanna. Continue to use the body of Christ in these last days in wondrous ways. Lord, we commit ourselves to you to be what you've called us to be. And Lord, we look expectantly to see the Spirit move in and through us, in and through your church. It is because of what you have done, what you have accomplished. You have done the work, not us. You will continue to do the work, and you choose to use us. I am so thankful for that. I am thankful for you. Lord, we stand, and we are in awe and wonder of who you are. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. I'll sing that again with me. I stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus.
and with the ransom in glory. Oh, his face I at last shall will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful that my song shall ever salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you are in this place, that you have sent your spirit, God, to fill us, to teach us, to instruct us, to show us how to see the world as you see them lost and in need of you, the Savior. Lord God, let that be our concern. In all that we do, in all that we say, Lord, Let our heart be towards you in worship to be what you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. John. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Wonderful. I feel I can't hear myself. All right. I need to figure this out. Give me two seconds. All right, sweet. My name is John, for those of you who don't know. uh, Hopefully you do now, because you guys see me every Sunday. Uh, I have the pleasure of doing announcements with you. Um, Yeah, let's go through them. The first announcements we have is Easter service times. So for Easter service, yeah, let's do it. We have Good Friday. That is March 29th at 7 p.m. We have the sunrise service, uh, what is that, Sun? yeah, Sunday, uh, March 31st at 6 a.m., so make sure everybody has their coffee by then. And then Resurrection Sunday celebration service will be at 10 a.m. This service is the one, the 10 a.m. service does have child care for nursery through sixth grade, and all services will be in the sanctuary and live streamed. Next one, we still need a uh, volunteer for the media. Uh, The commitment here is for every week while training. And then after that will be three weeks once fully trained. Yep. So here you will be controlling the lights, uh, the lyrics, verses on the screen. Um, And again, we will train you. Uh, You just need a willing heart to serve and to know how to run a computer. You know, not a, not a, Yeah, anyways, I won't go that far. If you are interested in learning this, go ahead and talk to Gavin after service today. Um, Yeah, he's he's here. Uh, Anyways, he'll be in the tech booth. Next one, moving along. Oh, we have a lot of announcements today, by the way, so bear with me here. Uh, next up is you can now sign up for the community, the spring community groups. Yeah, let's give it up. So those of you who are on a community group email, uh, you should have already received the list of things, I think. You should be, yep. And uh, let's see here. The reminder is the spring season runs from April 7th to June 1st. 
Uh, to sign up for a group, you can go to our app and click there, or you could go to uh, sign up there and go or go to groups.hosannachapel.org. Uh, when you do that, you can look at the community group, click on there, and sign up. And yeah, hopefully everybody's done it yet. How many of you signed up for a group yet? Wonderful. All right, we need all of you guys right back there. I'll be giving you guys sign-up sheets later. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, anyways, so for that, you could go ahead and sign up from there. All right, now I will give the nominees of who have signed up. Uh, well, not signed up. The groups. Yep, now the nominees. The first one is the co-ed groups. I was told I have to do this without messing up or I'll be in trouble. So we'll see how far we get. So the co-ed groups for the community groups, that's, that's a mouthful. Uh, the first one is Financial Peace University for Sundays. This one meets Sundays at 4.30 p.m. This will be in the student ministry building right down the street. With this, the groups will receive access to Ramsey Plus, a value of $130, which goes through a nine-week course. Um, yeah, nine-week course of Christian stewardship and finance. There is a $20 cost for this one instead of $130. Um, but, you know, don't break the bank for that one. It's just 20 bucks. Next one is we have another Financial Peace University class. Or, yeah, group. Uh, this will be Thursdays. This meets at 6 p.m. at a home in Bellflower. And this group will be doing the same thing. It will receive access to Ramsey's Plus. And again, it is a value of $130. And this one, again, is only 20 bucks. So we'll all be rich after this. So it, this one is a, a nine-week course as well. Uh, again, course of Christian stewardship and wonderful uh, finance. The next one up is, uh, what is it? Sorry, I lost it. Hosanna Evangelism. Sounded weird, sorry. Hosanna Evangelism. This one meets on Thursdays at 6 p.m. in the student ministry building. So what? All right, 6.30, not 6. Are you sure? All right, 6.30, pastor said it. All right, so this one meets at 6.30 on Thursdays in the student ministry building right down the street. They will be going through a course from the School of Biblical Evangelism called Reaching the Lost. Next one, uh, yep, co-ed, still on co-ed. Living Psalm 1-2. This group meets Wednesdays at 6.30, right? Wonderful, 6.30 in the student ministry building right down the street. Uh, how many of you guys know the student ministry building? Wonderful, because I'm going to keep saying down the street till you guys actually go down there. We'll do tours later today. Just kidding. Where am I at? Uh all right, Living Psalms 1-2. This group meets at Wednesday, 6.30, Student Ministry Building. And this does a meditative and reflective study on different passages of Scripture each week. Wonderful. Next up is Christian Creative Writing Workshop. That is, that is hard. I'm going to have them change that. Christian Creative Working... Anyways, this group meets on Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. in the Grounded House. I can't do this, guys. They will use uh, group writing prompts, and they will share writings to foster a space for spiritually sound feedback on creative writing pieces. I actually came up with that. I'm just kidding. So Christian Creative Writing Workshop, that's Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. On, or at the Grounded House. Next up, and the last one for the co-ed, is Digging Deeper. This one meets at 7 p.m. in the Grounded House. In this group, you will learn how to study the Bible by using inductive Bible study through the book of Philippians. That will be wonderful. Next one up is the women-only group. Groups? Groups? Yeah. First one is Gather in Prayer. This one meets Wednesday at 9 a.m. at a home in Whittier. They will gather for prayer over their families, church, and community as well. The next one is Women to Women Study. This one meets... Mondays at 6 p.m. in the Student Ministry Building, and they will be going through the Transforming Discipleship book, and that's by Greg Ogden, and they will be talking about what discipleship is, and we'll be learning what discipleship is from there. Next up, uh, last one for the women-only group is Bearing Burdens Together. 
Uh, this one meets Fridays at 6 p.m. at a home in Bellflower as well. I guess everybody lives in Bellflower. Uh, they, they'll be meeting up at a home in Bellflower. There's a de uh, depression support group for women and teens, and they'll be going through the book uh, called I Love Jesus, But I Want to Die. Okay. Uh, by Sarah J. Robinson. So they'll be going through that book, and it'll be wonderful. All right, last group is the men's only group, or men only groups. Yeah. First one is Christ-Centered Men's Study. We'll also be meeting at uh, 6 p.m. in the Grounded House, and they will also be going through the Transforming Discipleship book as well. So we'll, same thing as the, the women, we'll be learning how to disciple, how to be a disciple, how to follow Christ, and we will all learn. And we'll be also going through the book by Greg Ogden as well. We also have a men's Bible study and breakfast that meets Tuesdays at 6.15 at, in the morning at Denny's in Bellflower. So come and fellowship and have breakfast and Bible study. And last but not least, uh, let's see, men's discussion and prayer. This one meets Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at a home in Downey. This is a group of place where, or the group where men can meet up and discuss about things in life, work, whatever you want to talk about. That's mainly fellowship and surrounding God. With that, if you do have any questions with anything, because we ran through these pretty quick, uh, about any group, go ahead to sign up, view contact, and you could actually contact a leader and ask them the questions. But I think I answered them for you guys pretty well. With that, let's go ahead and pray. and We'll ask Pastor Nathan to come up. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time of fellowship. And Lord, I just pray that you bless us all and please fill Pastor Nathan with your spirit and bless him through this teaching that he has provided for us that you have given him, Lord. Thank you so much and please bless everybody in this room and everybody listening and please bless the lost as well, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Pastor Nathan. All right, thank you, John. Yeah, some of you might have done what I did too, and we're having a group this season that's dealing with uh, depression, and um, it's a serious topic, and uh, when the group leader showed me the book, I was like, whoa, that's a, that's a pretty intense uh, title of a book there, but um, if you've been there, you get it, and uh, so it's going to be a blessing, as well as all the groups this season. I just pray that you pray plug in to wherever you feel like the Lord is saying, hey, plug into this community because one of the greatest sources of healing within the body of Christ is when we gather together as a community and minister to one another, listening to the Lord and his uh, leading. So uh, with that, guys, we are going to be moving forward with our series here as we conclude today, part four, dealing with practical biblical financial habits. And, you know, there is quite a bit of practical financial advice pretty much everywhere you look today. You can go online and spend hours and hours and hours listening to people's advice about what to do. Sadly, there's a large, large contingent of the population today, even within the church, where we go to TikTok and Instagram to find out the latest financial hack, and we think that's going to fix our life and make things better. And, you know, I mean, some of the advice out there is good, and, and some of it is bad, but when it comes to practical wisdom on how to do this or how to do that, how we should live, God's Word should be the first and the best source for us as His kids. You know, God has an entire book in the Bible called Proverbs. It's all about wisdom, <laughs> how to live and what to do. And so um, God's Word, it, it gives us teaching. It gives us principles that apply to every single area of life, regardless of time or culture, right? God's Word, the wisdom we find there, it's an all and always in company, uh, encompassing treasure trove of wisdom, of what to do, of how to live, and not just for the sake of honoring God, which is a huge part of it, right? We want to honor God with our lives, but the wisdom we find in the Word is really um, what's going to be best for us, because God knows what's best for us, and God's ways are the best ways, and so what we see there is what's going to be best for us in our life. It's going to be ultimately what's going to result in the best for us. 
And that includes what we do with our money and our finances, to honor God and to be in the place of experiencing what God has for those who honor Him in those things. And so, as experienced by many within the church, um, the body of Christ who abide in God's words, really when we do things right, according to God's word, uh, which is His way, because it's about His wisdom, right, we experience right in the outcome. That applies to every area of our life. It's the thing we call obedience, that when we follow God's will and God's ways, we experience the blessing of what he has for us. And so as we've been walking through generosity and giving as Christians, and we've looked at why we give, we've looked at the motivation behind giving, uh, we looked at the call of collective participation by every single member of the body of Christ who is in the body of Christ, we now want to learn how how to steward things well according to God's word so that we can be people who are generous. So that as we do right with what God has given us and we find ourselves able to then do everything God wants us to do when it comes to being generous people. And so um, really the foundation of all of this and and some of this is, is overlapping to previous studies, but a proper biblical mindset is really what's foundational to good financial stewardship. It's important to know Um, this right off the top. God does not condemn wealth. God does not condemn anybody for having wealth. Um, Sometimes people will think that, you know, and it's just, it's, that's not true, right? You go through the scripture top to bottom, you find that God gave great wealth to Solomon, David, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Jehoshaphat, and many others in the Old Testament. You get to the New Testament, you find that there was Matthew, who was one of the 12 disciples. He was a man of means as a tax collector. You have Joanna, Joseph of Arimathea, Zacchaeus, Lydia. You have these people of great wealth and great means that were a part of the church, and they were very generous people as as members of the church. And so we see that, that God uses those people. And so wealth isn't inherently a sinful thing. But he does give grave warnings throughout his word to those who would seek wealth more than they seek God, and really to those who trust in wealth more than they trust in God. You have Matthew 13, 22, the parable of the sower, right? And he says in that parable, the deceitfulness of wealth can choke out the word of God in our lives. In Mark chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus said it's hard for those with riches to enter the kingdom of God. Not impossible, but it's hard. Why? Because it's easy to trust in wealth. When you have enough money for everything, it's easy to find ourselves trusting that instead of being fully dependent on God. And so there's these warnings that, that you know, although wealth isn't inherently bad or wrong, you don't want to trust in it. You don't want to depend on it. And then Luke 16, 13, Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money, right? So we have these warnings throughout Scripture, but Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, he says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, all right? Two things I want you to know there. It says the love of money. That's the problem, right? Problem is, is we get money and then we start to love it because we think it's the solution to, to everything in our life. And, and yeah, money can solve problems, but, you know, money um, itself is morally neutral And the problem is, is those whose master is wealth, those who trust in it for life, those who will listen to the deceitful lies of wealth that says, all you need is me. You don't need nothing else. You will provide for yourself. You're ultimately going to lose if that's your end all, because guess what? None of it goes with you. None of it goes with you, and it can't buy what is of true value, and that's eternal life. Eternal life only comes through trust in Jesus Christ. So Paul went on to say in 1 Timothy 6, 17, he was speaking to Timothy, and he goes, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Did you hear that last part? God is the one who richly provides for us or provides us with all things to enjoy. So again, having things, it's not wrong. Having a nice house, having a nice car, it's not wrong, right? 
I thought it was funny. Some, some uh, um, person on TikTok commented on one of our videos from the last few weeks, and it was some quote in one of the teachings, and he's like, oh, yeah, so you can have your huge salary and your nice Mercedes and send your kids to uh, private school. And I was like, well, uh, I don't have kids. I drive a 2012 Ford Escape, you know, and, and I, I, I get paid decently, but by no means am I living in mansions and driving Lamborghinis, you know, and, and I, I just laughed because of the perception the world has, right, when the church talks about money. Um, so Paul said, instruct those who are rich, because it's okay to be rich if that's what God has for you, okay? Um, just don't trust in it. You trust in God. He's the one that gave it to you anyways, right? And that's really the, the point I'm building up here. It's trust God, depend on him for all things, and steward what belongs to him, which is everything you have. Steward it rightly. Because wealth, biblically, we understand wealth can, can enhance good, but it could also create evil, right? Wealth is, is something that can be used for selfish goals, but it's also something that could be used for God's purposes. And so the reality, biblically, we have to understand that wealth is simply a tool. It's a tool, like every other tool that exists, that we can learn to use effectively like any other tool that exists. And when we see wealth and use wealth biblically, when we see it not as the end goal, but it is a means to an end, which is namely God's purposes in your life and in this world, then we're not going to find ourselves loving the wealth. But instead, we're going to find ourselves more and more in love with the, the wealth giver and pursuing his purposes and seeking his will with it. And so God says, and we've looked at this over the last few weeks, when you steward the wealth that I've given you, and I, and I use that wealth just to mean your, your material finances, because I know there's many of us that are like, I'm far from wealth, right? You know, but the money, the resources he's given you, and this also includes things like our time and talent. When we steward it the way God says to steward it, that means not trust in it, not to bend on it, not to serve it, not to worship it, not to waste it, not to squander it or hoard it, but instead we use it. We manage it, we build it, and then we give it. When we do that in the way that God has instructed us to do that, God says, I'll take care of you. I'll make sure you have enough for your needs, right? Not your greeds, but your needs. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 9 says this, and this is really a foundational concept when it comes to managing wealth financial or managing wealth uh, biblically. It says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we could take nothing out. For if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. And so the biblical admonition when it comes to stewarding what God has given you is to start with this idea. I'm content and I'm grateful for whatever I, with whatever I have. I'm content, right? God knows my needs. God has given me what I need. And then everything I have is his, and so I'm going to pray and seek, how do I use it for God's glory? How do I use it for his kingdom? Nothing wrong with being rich, but we see here wanting to be rich, really, is warned against. And it's really when we come to that place of being able to, to trust God, or when God trusts us to hold everything with an open hand, God says, hey, I want to give this to you, and it might be a million dollars. And we go, hey, God, Thanks. And he might say, steward that million dollars. And we're going to talk about that later when we see the, the principle of the talents. God gave one of them 10, and the guy came back and said, hey, I've made you 10 more. God said, good job. You stewarded it well. But when we hold it with an open hand and saying, okay, God put a million dollars in our hand, and we say, cool, God, thanks for that. I'm going to steward it well. And then God comes along and says, hey, I need my million dollars. We go, take it. It's yours. When we have that attitude, God says, I can trust you with a million dollars. You see the point? But when God gives us 10 bucks and we go, mine, mine, and God's like, hey, I need my 10 bucks, and you're like, oh, well, I wasted 90% of it paying high interest on a credit card to buy something I didn't need that I don't really, you know. God's like, well, then I can't give you $10 again because you're not going to steward it well. You guys following that? 
So the idea is when we're content, when we're not claiming what God gives us for ourselves, well, in that there's promises that God gives to people who do that. And he says, as you're generous, I'll be generous. He goes, as you give, it will be given to you. Why? Because I trust you to give it away, <laughs> right? So, um, the Bible teaches a very important truth with this. It's called the principle of cause and effect. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul writes this. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. We call it the law of sowing and reaping, right? Um, it's a law of the natural world as well as a law of the spiritual world. It's something we see throughout Scripture. The law of sowing and reaping implies that there's work and there's waiting, right? Um, Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Now, of course, it's a farming thing, right? You go plant seed, and then you wait, and you wait for the harvest to come. But it's a, it's a principle that applies all over the place, too. It's a sowing and reaping. You got to do the thing to get the result of the thing, right? And so you got to sow the seed to get the harvest. Another factor of the law of sowing and reaping is that we reap in kind to what we sow, right? In the spiritual world, the Bible tells us that you sow to the flesh, you reap destruction. But you sow to the Spirit, you reap eternal life. In the natural world, it works this way. You plant corn, guess what grows? Apples, <laughs> right? No, you plant corn, you get corn. Nobody's surprised by that. But what a lot of people do is they'll stand around at the hole in the ground and go, God, give me corn. I need corn, Lord. But you haven't planted any corn. You're not going to get corn if you don't plant corn. That's the idea. This is the sowing and reaping idea here. Actions have consequences. Scripture is a constant dance between our faith in God, right? We trust God. We trust his provision. He will provide for his people. And then our faithfulness to do the work, to do what he says to do. And so Luke chapter 16, verse 10, here's a parable about a, about a steward who has squandered everything he was entrusted with. And Jesus said this at the end of this parable, whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is unrighteous in very little is also unrighteous in much. And so again, we see this idea here that having a biblical view of the resources that God has entrusted to you, understanding it's not mine, it's his, understanding that he is the master is going to show up one day and go, hey, give me an accounting of what I gave to you, that should lead to us being good stewards of it. And it says here, if you steward the little God has given you, chances are, or if you steward it properly, chances are you'll steward a lot properly. But if you waste the little, you mishandle the little that God has given you, well, why is he going to give you more? Because the chances are you're going to mishandle it. So, and then 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it says, In this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. Faithful. You notice there that as a part of being a steward of what God has given us with our resources, managing isn't passive. We don't just sit on our uh, behind and, and just go, okay, well, God, you do something. We're to be faithful. We're to put in the work, do our part, following his word and managing what he's given us. And in and through that, God then works on our behalf. Now, again, this isn't about salvation, right? We know biblically salvation is that exception to this rule, right? That's the thing that God said, no, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you something that you didn't earn, that you can't earn, that you don't work for. I'm going to do something above and beyond so amazing, freely given to you salvation and, and, and forgiveness of all your sins, and all you got to do is receive it. And that's salvation. We receive freely by faith. And sometimes people will look at that, and then they'll look at finances, and they'll look at all these other things, and they go, well, why do we have to plant corn? Can't God just go, corn, and corn is, right? Didn't he do that in Genesis? Light, and light was. Now, yeah, God can do that. <laughs> he is God Almighty. But what we see in his word is that the norm that he has chosen to work through is that he says, we obey, we do, we follow, God blesses, God brings the harvest. That's how he chose to do it. Could he have done it another way? Sure. 
But what he chose to do is say, here's my word. I want obedience, not sacrifice. Do what I tell you to do. Live this way, think this way, behave this way, manage the resources I've given you this way, and things follow. You know, everything after free salvation are choices we make to be obedient or not to God and his word. And so, um, really, the idea is that in our salvation, we're given a new heart, we're given a new nature, we're given this, this new nature that, that, that is meant to help us be obedient to God, right? We're given the Holy Spirit to help, we're given God's word to help and guide us and direct us, but good stewardship doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't happen by accident. It takes intentional, deliberate, faithful decisions and actions on our part. So, with all of that setting this up, <laughs> it's already 1053, uh, let's talk about some of the practical steps so that then, yeah, we can steward well what God has entrusted us with. And then really in that, yeah, put ourselves in a position to, to, to be as generous as He is generous. That's the goal. I want to give like God gives. I want to be generous like God is generous. And so, what does he say? Now, there are many of you here in this room, you're already doing well financially. You're already managing what he's giving you well when it comes to your stewardship of his resources. You're, you're, you're right on top of it. And praise God for you, right? Praise God for that. And I, I pray that, that, that you are encouraged by what I'm about to share here through Scripture. Just be encouraged, yeah, I'm doing that. Praise God. I'm, I'm following the Lord's will and stuff. Um, just, you know, let it be affirmation and confirmation that, that you're following God well, you know. But there's also many of us here that are on the other side of the fence, and we're really struggling financially. And a lot of it is because poor financial habits, and I pray that this is an encouragement to you to follow God's way, okay? So Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent certainly lead to profit. But anyone who is reckless certainly becomes poor. Did you know that the idea of budgeting is in the Bible? It's right there. We just read it. You see, the concept of budgeting when it comes to what God has given you is simply a plan for your money. I'm going to have a plan for where my money goes. It comes in, it goes out. I'm going to have a plan for that. You know, and, and planning is, is not foreign to us. We plan for so much in our lives. We plan trips, right? Can you imagine, oh, I'm going to go on a trip to Europe. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'm just going to show up to the airport. I'm going to, maybe I'll end up on a plane. Who knows? And, and right? you go, that's foolish. That's, that's absolutely foolish. We plan goals. Why not plan for your money? And when we diligently plan, it says here where our money goes. Diligently plan instead of spending recklessly. Well, the difference here, it says, is profit instead of poverty. A lot of times we end up poor because we're just spending and we're nickel and diming ourselves to death and we have no idea where our money's going and what happens at, at the end of every month, right? We're like, <gasps> how do I have nothing left? Where did it go? Wise planning on, on many fronts is, is not only seen in Scripture, but it's encouraged throughout Scripture over and over and over. In Luke chapter 14, verses 28 and 30, Jesus is giving a teaching that's specifically about counting the cost of following him. But we see the principle of planning in this. He says this, For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if you have enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. You see the principle of planning there, of thinking ahead and going, okay, here's the resources, here's what I should do, because why? I have a goal. And if we have a goal of being generous the way Jesus is generous with our finances and our wealth, well, then we have to know what is happening with the resources that he's entrusted to us. And that's what a budget does. A budget allows us to know what we have, where it's going, right? And I'm talking all the way down to every penny. And we do that so we can make sure that every penny we got is wisely stewarded, wisely allocated. It's the idea of planning ahead beyond today's needs, beyond the week's needs or the month's needs. It's, it's budgeting ahead so you could learn to really say, okay, if I got to learn how to live on less than I make so that I have extra to do things that God is leading me to do with, budgeting is what helps you do that. 
until I started budgeting, I had no idea how much money I was really spending stopping at 7-Eleven every Sunday morning to get a pack of donuts and a, <laughs> a little coffee thing. Because I, I do it in one day, and I'm like, oh, it's like, you know, eight bucks. Well, eight bucks times four days a week, and that's not including the Starbucks trips during the week, and that's not including the, oh, I just don't feel like, you know, preparing food today. I'm going to stop at the fast food place, which is $20 a trip now, Right? When I finally sat down and, and was doing a budget, I was like, I spend how much on fast food? No wonder I'm broke. You know, I could save money by doing things. So a budget helps you see what's going on with all that type of stuff. And so in, in budgeting, yeah, you might discover that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm squandering the resources God has given me. I, I don't have to eat Jack in the Box three times a day, Right? You know, maybe I could brew coffee at home instead of pay the $6 Starbucks, right? You, you start to learn things like that when you see it laid out in front of you, and that's what Proverbs was talking about there when it says the plans of the diligent. You got to be diligent to think through and plan for what you're going to be doing. And then the whole idea is you learn to, to live on less than you got so that then you could save, right? Save for emergencies, be wise, prepare, and plan for um, what's going on with your family. I just, I just heard a story last night of, of a, a, a woman who called in to, to the show, and she goes, my husband got in a car accident last week, I think it was, and he's got permanent brain damage, and he's going to be permanently in the hospital. And she's like, he has a business, but I just found out that he's incredibly in debt in the business and didn't share it with me. And she's like, I have five kids. And she goes, well, what do I do? If that was your situation, what would you do, right? We don't know the future. We don't know when things are going to happen, and so we want to be able to save. And Proverbs 21.20 talks about this. It says, precious treasure and oil are in the dwelling of a wise person, but a fool consumes them. What does that mean? It's the idea of gobbling up everything you make every time you get it, right? Right? The wise person has things set aside, stored in their house for an emergency. They have resources set aside. The foolish person consumes them, and that's what consumes them mean. It means to gobble it up. That means spending every penny you make. It's foolish to do so because you don't know what the future holds, right? You don't know what could happen. And, and really, a question to ask ourselves as God's stewards, right, because we want to be available for God's purposes and to do, do um, um, serving God and, and all these things we want to be available for. But we, if we fall into some major financial disaster and we're not ready for it, well, everything gets put on hold, right, because we got to deal with some really bad things. And, and well, if we didn't save... If we didn't steward well, we find ourselves in very, very difficult situations. One study recently done says 48% of Americans would not be able to cover their basic expenses past 90 days if they lost their job today. That means for those of you with families and kids, according to statistics, half of you, if you lost your job today, you have three months before you're going to lose everything. That's a dangerous statistic to look at. And so in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, this is what God says in his word. He goes, go to the ant, you slacker. God said that, not me, okay? He goes, observe its ways and become wise. Without a leader, without an administrator, without a ruler, it prepares its provisions in summer and it gathers its food during harvest. That's the principle of saving and planning ahead for emergencies, right? And yeah, budgeting is hard, Right? Saving is hard. I mean, up until fairly recently, I used to think budgeting was a cuss word, right? You say budget, I'm like, shut your mouth. But then slowly God was like, hey, do you, do you believe my word? Well, yes, of course I do. Well, then read these things and listen to what they say. Because budgeting is you telling you what to do. And I don't know if you're like me. I could be like, don't tell me what to do. And I'm like, who's that person telling me that? I'm looking in the mirror. It's like, what? Like, don't fight yourself. Just, just what does God say? And it's hard. It's difficult to put these things into practice. You know, Hebrews 12, 11, it says, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. That word discipline there literally says, correcting guidance for responsible living. <laughs> so when the Bible says, do this with your money and not this with your money, it may not be fun at the time. 
But look at what he goes on to say. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, which is right living to those who have been trained by it. So don't be the foolish person of Proverbs 21.20 and consume everything you have. Instead, plan. Budget. Learn to live on less than you make so you can save for emergencies so they don't wipe you out if something happens. And then, in that process, you're able to start setting aside things so you can move forward being generous as God is generous with you. Now, one of the biggest challenges many of us have financially and that really affects our generosity is debt, right? A lot of us have debt. Now, I want to be very clear. The Bible doesn't forbid debt, right? Being in debt is not a sin, um, but the Bible does have many warnings against going into debt unnecessarily, and it lifts up the virtue of, of just not going into debt. For example, Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave, to the lender. Translation, if you owe someone money, they control your life until you pay them back. And then Romans 13, 8, Paul said this, do not owe anyone anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The idea when it comes to debt, right, and, and how the Bible warns against it is you really don't want anybody controlling your life except Jesus. Nobody should have control over your life. And yet when we find ourselves in debt, we find ourselves working to pay other people because of interest and things, and, and it really ends up putting us in a type of slavery. You know, and just broadly, you know, and I think the reason the Bible warns against it, doesn't forbid it, but it warns against going in debt is because debt is risky. It's risky, and regardless of your situation, the lender expects you to pay it back, right? Right? You ever called someone you owed money to, a credit card or something, and you said, hey, I can't pay you because, you know, I'm just, you know, can you just trust me? What do they say? Yeah, well, you'll be hearing from our trust department. It's called collections. <laughs> now, on top of that, when it comes to debt, most of us are, are in debt that is charging interest in most cases. The average credit card today, this is the average, this is the middle number, charge 20, charges 28% interest. 28%. You know what that means? That means for every $100 you charge, you're paying back $128. You're paying an additional $28 that you didn't intend to spend just for the privilege of being able to put it on a card. Now, again, debt's risky. Debt steals your money. And the further we sink ourselves into debt, the more of our money it takes. Now, yeah, there, there are things in our lives that, that may absolutely require debt. And please don't misunderstand me. I personally believe that is a very, very small list, okay? Because um, all of us are like, oh, Starbucks, I need to go into debt for Starbucks. No, you don't. You don't need to pay interest on Starbucks, right? But like buying a home. That's like one of the biggest purchases people might make in their lives. And, you know, I know many of you think, oh, that reality is never going to exist anymore <laughs> in our market. But, but it's a big one, right? And, and very few of us would have the money to go out and buy a house outright, especially with the cost of housing today. But the idea biblically is if there's any way to avoid going into debt, if there's any way to, to not do it, don't do it so that you won't be enslaved to the lender. You know, I was looking up stats on this, and you got the four big credit card companies, MasterCard, Visa, Amex, and Discover. And uh, recently, over the last few years, I found a thing that said they spent $4 billion marketing to us to get us to use credit cards. How could they spend $4 billion to get us to use credit cards? You know why? Because they made $88 billion off of interest and penalty fees. That was $88 billion that nobody intended to spend, but it was the, hey, thank you for letting me buy it on a credit card cost. When we don't plan, when we don't save, when we don't budget, and instead borrow ourselves into slavery, unnecessarily going further and further into debt, we're simply not being good stewards of what God has trusted to us. God didn't say, I gave you this so you could spend $88 billion of it paying interest fees to lenders. 
So you got to be careful, right? When we do plan, when we do budget, when we do learn to live on less than we make, when we do, you know, get ourselves out of unnecessary debt or all the debt we have, then guess what? You're able to have money set aside to save for those emergencies, right? Those financial uh, catastrophes. We see this in Genesis chapter 41 where Joseph got a vision and God said there's a famine coming. What did he do? He started saving up grain, right? And it saved the whole nation because he planned ahead. They didn't eat all the grain as they got it. They, they budgeted it out. We're also then able to start somewhere with generosity as the Lord teaches us. To say, okay, God, I want to be generous, so you are generous. And we talked about that last week. It's not about the amount. It's about the heart. Ephesians chapter 4, 28, it says, do honest work with your own hands so that you have something to share with anyone in need. That's a biblical mandate. You know what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3? He said, you don't work, you don't eat. Right? The church is here to help. We as the body of Christ are here to help. We have benevolence ministries and things like that. But the Bible has a whole lot to say about how you qualify to get help from the local body of Christ when you're in need. And it's pretty strict, actually, you know? It's not to say we don't want to help people, but, but there are far too many people who want to take advantage, and so the Bible is very clear. Work. If you can work, work. You need to work so that you earn, so that you have something not only for yourself, but to help those that are in need. We're able to provide for the needs of our families when we're saving for emergencies without worry or anxiety. And again, this is one of those verses, 1 Timothy 5.8, but if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow. Wow. We're able to then save for our future, right? Save for retirement or save to leave something behind for our families um, generationally. Proverbs 13.22, it says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. And, and yeah, that's more than just money, right? But the whole idea of, of planning appropriately so that you can leave something behind is biblical. And this all comes from the blessing of stewarding what God has given you faithfully. Stewarding what God has given you biblically. As we are faithful in the little, God can trust you with more. And as God trusts you with more, you could do more with more. Right? Did that make sense? Yeah, I think so. All right. <laughs> but why does God give you more when you're faithful in the little? Because he knows you're going to manage it well. You're not going to squander it. You're not going to gobble it up. You're not going to waste it. Now, that's the idea here. I want to kind of close out here on a, on a parable that Jesus told, and this is a parable that adds one final element to biblical stewardship that I want to add in here. It's in Matthew chapter 25, starts in verse 14. And it's really, it's talking about the coming of the kingdom of, of heaven is the, the precise context. But it says, um, it's just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received the five talents put them to work and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, went off dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five. See, I've earned five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached, and he said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have at least deposited my money with the bankers, and I would receive my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given. 
and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This parable teaches a universal truth that has universal application. Since the very beginning of time, since the very beginning of the creation of mankind, every single individual on earth has been entrusted with resources of time and resources of ability and resources of material wealth. Now, yes, it all belongs to him because he is the master. It is all his. But we are responsible for managing those resources well. And we see that we are to use those resources in such a way that they increase in value. If he's given you a a calling, you are to develop that calling so that that calling increases in value to the body and the people around you. If he's given you time, you are to use that time doing what is of greatest value, that has the greatest return, right? He said, "Redeem, redeem the time for the days are short. If he's given you a natural ability that can, that can bless others and glorify his name in his kingdom, develop that ability. That one's easy one like with worship ministry, right? You know, if God calls you to a worship team and you give an ability with an instrument, you're expected to develop that ability. If you're a speaker, get better at speaking. If you're a, a servant, if you're an organizer, get, just do better with those abilities. But also, whatever he's given you materially, financially, Wisely manage it so that it will have the maximum effect, the maximum return for you, yeah, for your family, yeah, for your future family generationally, sure, for your spiritual family, yeah, but for God's kingdom and God's purposes to his glory forever. And that parable tells us that if we manage well what God has given to us, he will entrust us with more. But if we waste $88 billion enslaved to lenders, paying out monies far and above what we purchased because, well, I couldn't wait to save to buy that thing I wanted. I couldn't wait, uh, uh, or, or I, I just wasn't prepared for that financial emergency, and now it's wiped everything out. Or we're just simply gobbling up everything we make on ourselves because, well, after all, I'm, my own pleasure is the most important thing on my priority list. And then we come around and try to say, oh, Lord... I'm so sorry, I, I, I can't give. I can't be generous in the way that, that you're calling me to be generous because I, I don't have anything, I'm broke. And we do that instead of taking responsibility for maybe our poor financial habits and maybe taking responsibility for what might be unwise spending or whatever in our lives. Well, Scripture seems to be very, very clear on that. You sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. So generously, you will reap generously. Now, because I believe so strongly in not just telling you guys, this is what the Bible says, but, but, but equipping you guys. I like to try and put tools into people's hands. That's why we provide tracks so you can go out and evangelize. Um, but I really want to provide tools to the body here to help you guys learn how to be better stewards, Right? And really, in just the practicality of just managing money well according to biblical principles, um, you saw two of our community groups that were launching this season. It's a resource that, that we're able to make available to every single family here in the body. Um, and it's designed to teach and equip each one of us on really applying these biblical principles in our lives. Now, it's a program that is, is designed to work best in a group format. That's why we're kind of launching it with our community groups. Um, but um, you can do it on your own as well, you know. But the idea is that we're going to be launching these groups so that people can enroll in this, this class. It's a nine-week class called Financial Peace University. Um, I do know that it's, you know, um, um, it's not the end-all gospel <laughs> in financial stuff. It's just one tool that, that we've come across. I've personally been in some of the classes and have personally benefited from it as well as I'm seeing um, specific people benefit from some of the teaching. So we just wanted to play it, just a real quick video to show you kind of what the class is going to go about, and then um, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about it. But the idea is, is to take what Scripture says, buckle down, learn, and apply. That's the idea, right? To put into practice. And, 
you know, if you're like me and budgeting is a cuss word, right, you might have to learn some things to unlearn some things so that you could then start doing good with what God has given you. But if we could just roll that clip real quick, that'd be great. And then we started saying, okay, these principles that we're learning, what do you do first? Do you save money and invest? That's important. Do, do you get insurance? Do you, do you have your emergency fund first or do you get out of debt? What about paying off your house? You know, what about building wealth? What about the power of compound interest and getting that working for you to be a millionaire? Which of these things do you do first? And it was confusing and people said, I don't know what to do first. And I said, well, I don't either. And, and, and then I just ran into this thing and it said, you can do anything if you do it a bite at a time. That's how you eat an elephant, a bite at a time. And so we started figuring out that good financial planning and applying these principles in order works, and we call them the baby steps. Baby step one is you save $1,000. Baby step two, as soon as you've done that, is you work the debt snowball. And then baby step three, once you've done that, you go back to that $1,000 and raise it up to a fully funded grandma's rainy day fund of three to six months of expenses. Once that's done, then we do four, five, and six simultaneously. We start working on retirement, kids' college, and any extra money we throw at paying off the house early. And then that brings us to baby step seven, where we just live and give like no one else, where we build wealth and we're outrageously generous. And, and that's our outline of what we're going to go through together. This is the process we're going to go through together to take these principles of living debt-free, of living on a budget, these principles, and how do we apply them in what order? That's the order. So again, um, I've been through the course myself, and I, I think the principles are solid. You know, they, they seem to work. There's over 10, 20 million people that have been through uh, what they call Financial Peace University and really had their lives changed, you know, when it comes to their financial outlook. And so, um, as we mentioned in the, in the intro thing, there's a whole slew of teaching and training and resources that they have a part of this. And usually, um, it's, it's like $130 to, to have this service that, that, that you're committed to. And, you know, I always hear people that, that, that are struggling with money going, well, I have no money. How am I supposed to, you know, pay something to, to make money? And that's another conversation we could have. But um, because I feel you, um, the church has actually made an investment uh, to make that whole thing available to you guys for 20 bucks. So um, we figured $20 is affordable for most people. And if you can't afford the 20 bucks and you want to take the class, please talk to me. Okay, um, because I really do believe the principles, when we learn these biblical principles, and he drills down into stuff much deeper than I did, and learn how to apply these principles, um, it really is, is life-changing. Now, um, I'm telling you this just because there's a clock on it. We, we have a one-year opportunity to make it available to you guys for the price we're able to make it available to you guys, and so that one-year clock starts in April. So... Um, if you decide to wait six months and go, okay, I want to do this, you only have six months available for all the training materials and stuff. But um, I share all of that because I pray you take advantage of the tool. If you're not going to take advantage of that tool, do something. Do something, right? Learn what Scripture says and apply these things because um, the end result is that we're stewarding what God has given us well. That's the end result, right? Right? Like I said, um, this particular training content, it's not the end-all gospel to financial stewardship, but it's a tool among tools, and, um, and we want to make it available to you guys. So, But there's truly much more that Scripture teaches about money and how to steward it biblically, right? And I pray that in your own reading, in your own devotional time, in your own just sitting down with the Word of God and, and seeking Him, that, that you learn, that the Lord would speak to you about what He has to say about your finances and how to steward those things well so that you could benefit from that. But, you know, just as a real quick uh, recap here, and then we'll be done, you know, get on a budget, Right? Because Proverbs 21.5 says, the plans of the diligent certainly lead to profit, but anyone who is reckless certainly becomes poor. Figure out what you got, figure out where it's going, and then figure out how to tell it where you want it to go. Then you get on a budget so that you could learn to live on less than you make so you have that extra margin. And so we do that because Proverbs 21.20 says, a fool spends whatever they get. You learn to live on less than you make so you can get out of debt because Proverbs 22.7 says the rich rule over the poor and a borrower is slave to the lender. You get out of debt so you could start having money to save for emergencies and plan for those things because Proverbs 21.20 says precious treasure and oil are in the dwelling of a wise person. 
And so now you're kind of saving and, 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 you know, just setting yourself up to be safe for, for those emergencies, right? When the car needs uh, surprise repairs, when the kid needs to go to the emergency room or something. And so now from a place of, of financial stability and security, you can start to then multiply what God has given you through wise stewardship, right? Um, the whole idea is to do more so you could bless more and on and on. And this all takes effort and diligence and planning and focus, and you may not like it at first, but, you know, Hebrews 12, 11 says, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time. But if you learn to not squander everything you make, you can not only save for difficult situations, but you could be in that place of leaving a legacy because Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. And through the whole process, you, you learn and seek, and uh, God, I want to be generous the way you're generous. Show me where to start. Show me where to, to get started in this, and, and then as you grow and manage what God has given you well and get yourself out of debt and not be wasting all your money on, on things that are frivolous or whatever, then you're going to find yourself increasingly more able to be generous the way Jesus is generous. And you get to live without the worry and the fear of financial emergencies and without the restrictions, oh, I'm just paycheck to paycheck. You get yourself out of debt completely so there's no more interest payments just leaking out the thing and, and you go from, from just being a giver to being an, an outrageous giver to be able to give a lot, which is so much fun, you know? When you go from, okay, God, I'm trying to find out the minimum amount I could give to still be obedient to you. When you're able to go from that to, God, I just want to give lavishly, hilariously, cheerfully. I want to do things for people the way you do things for people. And, and we seek that. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says God loves a cheerful giver. And that's really the goal is to steward what he has for us so that, yeah, we're taking care of our family, we're taking care of our business, we're taking care of all those important things, but we're able to be generous as he is generous. Cheerfully, willingly, lavishly, right? That word hilarious when it says God loves a cheerful giver. I always look at that word hilarious and it's that kind of like giving where you kind of laugh, laugh nervously after you did it. <laughs> I, I just gave how much? Wow. Woo. But isn't that our God who just gives over and above? And he just wants us to be just like that, you know? And I am by no means a, a wealthy individual by any means, but I could tell you generosity is fun. And many of you in here have experienced that when you're able to, to you know, not just hand someone a few dollars, but God brings you to the place where you're able to give someone a car. And they're just like, oh my goodness. Can you imagine being able to, to pay off someone's house that's struggling? A single mom who's just like praying, God, please. And uh, I mean, God could use you to do that. But he can't do it if you love the money. It's when you stop loving the money that he gives you the money. It's just a weird dichotomy of his kingdom. Seek him. Seek to be obedient to him. Seek to do with what you have what he is teaching you and calling you to do with what you have. And give cheerfully, lavishly, willingly. Start wherever you're at and figure out what that is, right? There's no percentage to be right and wrong. There's no, this is the sinful percentage, this is the godly percentage. Start somewhere. Be faithful, and I guarantee you, watch God bless you. And you get to step in those shoes that, that he has to be just like our Lord and Savior. And, and when you're a giver, you get to experience being like him in ways some people never get to experience. And it is awesome. Amen? Let's pray. Father, oh, Lord, you are so gracious. And you call us to be gracious as you are gracious. Lord, you are so generous. And you call us to be generous as you are generous. So, Lord, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would deal with our hearts, Lord, that we wouldn't be consumed by materialistic thinking. We wouldn't be consumed by fear and anxiety that would cause us to hoard and hang on to everything because we're just constantly expecting the worst to happen. And then, Lord, we wouldn't be people who are expecting the worst to happen because we haven't done anything to be ready in case something bad happens. But, Lord, we would 
learn what your word says to not just get the theory of giving, but Lord, the practical application, Lord, of things like budgeting and planning ahead, saving for emergencies so they don't wipe us out when they happen, being ready, Lord, if you tarry and we're still here for another generation or 10 more generations, Lord, that we're able to leave a legacy to our grandchildren. Lord, that we would be faithfully using what you give us, Lord, and, and that God be people where you would look and say, I trust you with, with whatever. Lord, that you would look at us as your people and say, I could trust you with this because you're going to manage it well. That you're going to be generous as I am generous. You are going to help the poor and you're going to help the suffering and you're going to take care of those in need, God. And that we as a church, as we collectively pull together to do that, Lord, we would not be restricted by these practical, tangible things, Lord, but that we would really experience the blessing you have for us individually and then as a body of Christ, Lord, that we would be able to do whatever it is you're calling us to do without having to think, can we afford it? But Lord, in and through all of that, we want to serve you. We want to follow you. We want to trust you, Lord. And so, Lord, never give us so much that we don't trust you. But Lord, also keep us out of these places of having such lack that we blame you. Because we know, Lord, that we are called to be stewards of what you've given us. So teach us and help us to make right choices. And bless us that we would be a giver just like you are a giver, Lord. Cheerfully, joyfully, hilariously. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship, guys.
praise the Lord. God bless all of you as you go from here, as you live, just as Christ has exampled us, right? Just as he's given in his word. This morning, I just want to invite anyone who needs prayer to come down as soon as we're finished and just let you know we'll be down front here to pray with you so that we might take it all before the Lord and seek him. God bless you as you serve the Lord this week. Amen? Amen. God bless you.